Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to part two of our industrial brick tutorial series. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the disgusting looking dirty bricks. To start off with, if you haven't seen part one in this series about industrial bricks and industrial saunas specifically, I highly recommend you going to check out that video first, because once again, this is part two to that continuing series. Now, the first thing you might notice about our dirty brick here is that there are no steam turbines. And the reason is simple is it's not hot enough to warrant it. Additionally, this place is filled with carbon dioxide, but there are ways around that as well. Now this is called a dirty brick for the reason of it's where you're putting all your dirty industries. And whenever this massive colony requires power, this dirty brick comes alive. We have 10 petroleum generators, six natural gas generators, six coal generators, and three hydrogen generators plus an overflow. And of course, no echo colony would be complete without a ridiculous amount of buffer tanks. Now, some important notes about your dirty bricks is that you're going to need a method to get rid of all the polluted water being generated by the natural gas generators and the petroleum generators. And because this brick is below 100 degrees, we are not at risk for any of that water flashing into steam. We have plenty of liquid pumps. That way, all the water is absorbed rather quickly, where it is eventually sent to another part of the colony. But one of the key features of this setup, because it's producing so much carbon dioxide, with current pressure being around 93 kilos per tile, is we're able to fully support a slickster ranch. What you're looking at here is 48 slicksters, producing an absolute incredible amount of oil. Now, some of the features that we use to keep this cool is all the petroleum that comes in is sitting in the buffer tanks. And you'll notice the petroleum itself is coming in at around 55 degrees. Additionally, all the natural gas that was coming into this brick starts off at around 36 degrees. And we also are not putting any of that natural gas into insulated piping. Now, because this particular colony has so many other sources of power, this brick is currently turned off. You can see these batteries are set at zero and zero, the coal generator is zero and zero, and finally the hydrogen generator is zero and zero. In order to keep this whole brick under 100 degrees, it might be worth it occasionally turning some of the petroleum generators or natural gas generators off once the brick hits a certain temperature. As an aside, in this colony, the reason why all those are turned off is because we had a cold brick producing all the power. That's right. In the ridiculousness of the Max Paradise series, we could choose between the dirty brick, the cold brick, or the two hot industrial saunas. And if you wanted to control temperature that way, you could simply put a nice thermo sensor here, and once it became too hot, you could just turn the generators off and switch power over to another source. There are other methods of keeping your dirty brick cold enough to where you don't have flashing water. Let's go take a look at those now. In our chilled series, we used a dirty brick in multiple ways. Not only did it house our glass forge, our kilns and rock crushers, it was also the center of an ethanol plant. We had lumber coming in, the ethanol distillery emits polluted dirt and carbon dioxide, whereas once again, we don't mind the carbon dioxide, and that's the benefit of the dirty brick. We're taking all that carbon dioxide and feeding it to a couple of massive slickster stables. And we didn't let the fact that we had a chlorine gas vent get in the way of our implementation. Now in this method, we used active cooling to keep the entire dirty brick within temps. It's hovering around 87 degrees in here. This way, all the water being produced by the petroleum generators and the ethanol distilleries could drop down in here and being collected by this liquid pump. Once again, we have a double liquid lock with naphtha on the inside and water on the outside. We used a crisscross pattern of temperature shift plates, this time made out of mafic rock. Now, mafic rock is not as good as igneous rock, but they're still doing the job fine. You can see it's 87 degrees down here and 87 degrees up here. Now, we have a couple of metal refineries up here, and you can see this was sort of built as an afterthought, because had I done it from the rip, it would have been better to have the radiant liquid pipes inside the steam chamber up here. And that way we were injecting more heat into the steam chamber, which would have caused this thermo aqua tuner to run less often and these steam turbines to run more often. The other two aqua tuners are doing different functions. This one here, keeping the steam turbines cold. This one here, providing the chill. 
for our deep freezer. Alluding back to our first episode in this series, that you can cram as many thermo aqua tuners into this chamber as you can, and as long as you have enough steam turbines, it's a perfect place to centralize all your heating and cooling needs. A couple of other items that make this implementation of a dirty brick interesting is we have a couple of canister fillers in here, one collecting hydrogen and the other collecting carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is being collected for a couple of soda fountains and the hydrogen's being collected for, well, because sometimes you just need hydrogen. For instance, in your Dreco starvation chamber. So this was the second method we used to keep the temperature down below the threshold to where we could collect all this polluted water. But as I like to say, there's more than one way to skin a pip. And in this case, we have another example for you. Now to introduce you to the dirtiest brick of them all. In this implementation, this dirty brick doesn't care if it's steam or carbon dioxide. It joins together in a slurry of madness. When this implementation was being started, we add the liquid pumps to get rid of the polluted water so it wouldn't off gas. But now there's so much heat in here that we don't necessarily need them. And there's a certain equilibrium that you can hit with this implementation. Right now, this brick is at about 130 degrees, but eventually it'll be around 120 to where the polluted water will not be turning into steam and still being siphoned out with the liquid pumps and yet it will not be cool enough for this steam to condense back into water at around 100 degrees. So the sweet spot for this brick is around 115 degrees. But every once in a while, it's going to get above that. Hence the reason we need a way to deal with that steam. And there are a couple of methods of being able to do that. First, you could take a couple of gas pumps, taking out all the gas, separating the steam from the carbon dioxide, and doing with it what you will. But in this implementation, we used a gas crusher. This gas crusher opens periodically. It lets a bunch of gases in, and then after a certain amount of time, this first door will close, followed by the rest of the doors destroying all of that gas. The primary purpose of that system is to keep the pressure in here low enough to where these natural gas generators can still eject all the carbon dioxide they're creating. Now, eventually these natural gas generators would get backed up in this current implementation, but to fix that, all we'd have to do is adjust these timer sensors to have them turn on and turn off more quickly. One method of doing that is we could actually power them so they open and close more quickly. The second is shorten the amount of time. Now the automation behind this system is pretty simple. We have two timer sensors. One is controlling the first mechanized airlock. The second is controlling the rest of them. Of note, these timer sensors have to be identically matched in total time. You can see this one has a red duration of 15, a green duration of 25 for a total of 75. Likewise, out of the first timer, that has a green of 20 and a red of 55, both of them adding up to 75. That way they're in sync. In fact, once you get both of them installed, you pause the game and you reset the timers. Now the idea is all the doors open at the same time, and that's when the arrow gets to the green, but this one shuts about five seconds sooner. That way it traps all the gas in here before the rest of the mechanized airlocks actually destroy it. And at this point, these doors are about to shut. And what we're about to destroy is 28 kilos of pressure at the front and about 14 kilos at the back. It's a nice little system to be able to keep all that gas pressure minimized. But then again, you could pump it all to an independent slickster ranch. You have a lot of options with this method. And you may wonder why we chose to put the gas crusher at the top of the sauna. And it's because we do have slicksters in here. Because the slicksters only like to eat carbon dioxide, if we put the gas crusher at the bottom, it would prioritize crushing carbon dioxide. But by putting it at the top, it's more likely that steam is going to rush into this chamber. So it'll keep the majority of the dirty brick carbon dioxide. Notice, unlike the previous two implementations, we actually have metal tiles at the top here. And that's because all the heat being generated in here is exchanging with the steam room above it. And then the steam turbines only interact with the steam room, causing there to be nothing but pure steam up top. And then once again, a slurry of mess down bottom. Now, because there's a major volcano in here, you can see this igneous rock is still sitting at, I don't know, 1200 degrees. To better distribute this heat, 
we could put in a nice conveyor system. We'll put a conveyor loader here, and then another one here. We'll connect them by rail, and then we can have those rails going right through the steam room connected to our steam turbines, and then a couple of auto sweepers in place to pick all the goods up. Now I have these conveyor loaders set to pick everything up. They'll start loading everything on these rails. And watch what this is going to do to all these steam turbines. Notice the current wattage is quickly climbing as all that hot igneous rock is making its way through the steam room. At the end of this run, we could have even put in a nice system to where it would check the temperature of the igneous rock and if it still has more temp, we could send it right back through. In this case though, we're just dropping it here on an aluminum metal tile and the same thermo aqua tuner that is chilling the steam turbines is providing some chill for this tile which will eventually drive down the temp on this igneous rock as well. Once again, a lot of ways to implement this. But in this case, we're definitely not going to be able to get rid of all that steam. But running that hot igneous rock, the only time that we'd actually be able to collect a significant amount of polluted water being generated from the petroleum generators or the natural gas generators are going to be when this volcano goes dormant. And even though we are generating a lot of power initially, once you get through that back stock of igneous rock, everything's going to sort of simmer down again, at least until the next time this volcano erupts. Now, full disclosure with your dirty bricks, they are typically a little bit more difficult to implement than their industrial sauna cousins, especially if you're not providing them independent cooling so that they don't create steam. Because when you have multiple gases in one system, you have to have some extra contingencies on what to do with it all. In this case, we wouldn't need to care at all about these natural gas generators if we just took all of the exhaust coming out from the natural gas generators and sent it somewhere else. For instance, directly to a pair of carbon skimmers. And these carbon skimmers are connected to our bathroom system. So all the clean water is being provided for them and all the polluted water is being sent right back to the water sieve that's responsible for cleaning the water for the bathrooms. And with all of that exhaust taken care of, then we don't care what the gas pressure is in this room until one of your liquid locks breaks and then you're in big trouble. So I hope this second part of our industrial brick series has given you a couple of examples of how you can implement a dirty brick of your own. Stay tuned next time for part three where we're going to be going into the mysterious cold brick, which might be one of the most difficult bricks to implement. I'm looking forward to reading your comments about what you thought of this episode and if you have any tips and tricks that you like to implement in your dirty bricks. So until next time, I'll talk to you soon.